Welcome back to State of Texas In-Depth. Joining us now ahead of the state's primary election, our political roundtable. Morgan Smith from our media partner, the Texas Tribune, and Brian Sweeney from Texas Monthly. Welcome, guys. Thank Morning. you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. So we just heard from Leticia Vandefeud here on the program, and I just want to know, she doesn't really have a competitor for this primary, so how is that going to help her out as she gets into the general election race? Well, I mean, this means she can start campaigning right away for the general election while whoever is going to be her opponent is still stuck in the Republican primary and potentially having to take more polarizing positions in order to attract primary voters um, that you know, could end up harming them in, in a general election. But has, has it been to her benefit to not, uh, you know, have anyone like Wendy Davis has Greg Abbott, even though they don't have strong competitors for the primary, they've already been beating up on each other ahead of the general. Yeah, and I think that uh, Senator Van De Pute has started engaging with some of the lieutenant governor candidates and we have seen that dynamic where they can't really focus on responding to her attacks because they're all still caught up attacking each other. So what do you expect will happen after the primary for Leticia Van Der Poel? Certainly that's when it kicks into gear. I, I agree with Morgan. Right now is the opportunity for her to get her feet underneath her. There is so much pressure at the top of the ticket for the Democrats with Senator Davis trying to work out some of the problems and kinks with her own campaign. I think it's good for her. Certainly if this were a competitive state, she would just have to be, you know, smiling from ear to ear, given how far to the right the four candidates have pushed on the Republican side, where obviously uh, March 4th is going to be the undercard. Uh, the main event is going to come in the runoff on May 27th. Uh, that buys her a lot of time, and I think she's going to continue to hope that those candidates, as they continue to fight with each other, hurt themselves and their chances going forward. But that remains to be seen. Obviously, this is a very, very conservative state, and it doesn't seem to me that those candidates on the Republican side are particularly concerned about something that they're saying now coming back to hurt them in November. You know, we mentioned Wendy Davis and Greg Abbott. It seems like this past week it's been the Ted Nugent factor. Uh, and what, what's the big deal with that for people don't, that don't really know who Ted Nugent is or how controversial he can be? I, I think this is one of those interesting examples of something that they thought was a very, very smart move completely blowing up in their face, not only blowing up on their in their face, sort of for a day one story that a bunch of us are talking about here in Texas, but it's become a national story. You now have Rick Perry weighing in on it on CNN. You have Rand Paul now saying that Ted Nugent may, needs to apologize. And what I find very interesting is given how uh, Attorney General Abbott is positioned in this race, where all he sort of has to do is just keep it on the road, straight and steady, not make any, take any risks. What, and what we have always heard about him is what a smart and solid campaigner. This is now kind of another in a series of missteps that I think that he has made and this to me seems to be a big one. Will it damage him? Maybe not, but it certainly has taken a little bit of the shine off. And Democrats have really lashed out about this issue in particular. Right, I mean I think it's a, it's it was kind of it was a choice that I think had uh, General Abbott had a you know, really competitive primary opponent it might have made more sense but since he has like vastly outraised all of his all of the other folks that are running in the Republican primary for governor and he really is seen as this heir apparent to um, for the Republican nomination he didn't really have to activate that that base that that um, Ted Nugent activates and I think instead it, it has kind of exposed him to criticism about remarks that Ted Nugent has made about the president, about uh, his admissions that he has, as an adult, slept with underage girls, and it has brought up a lot of uncomfortable questions that you really don't want to be dealing with when you're a candidate. So back to the lieutenant governor race, do you, uh, obviously we keep hearing that there's probably going to be a runoff on the Republican side. If it is David Dewhurst, who do you think the most likely person that he will be running off against would be? Well, I think that, you know, leading up probably to this week, uh, the answer would have been Dan Patrick, and I don't know how that has changed yet exactly, except for we had at the start of this week a kind of a bombshell dropped in this race that Dan Patrick had hired undocumented workers in his a chain of his restaurants early um, that he ran in the 80s. Um, this is something that the Patrick campaign has denied, but these kinds of claims tend to ricochet, you know, despite anything that the other candidate had that you know w despite his response so I think we'll have to see whether that 
peels off enough Patrick voters and then who those Patrick voters go to right. before we can really determine if that's going to change the outcome in a runoff. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here with us, guys. Got to catch you off right there. But don't forget to vote. The Texas primary election is less than two weeks on March 4th, and early voting is happening until the 28th of this month. Thanks for watching State of Texas In-Depth. Join us every Sunday morning at 830.